from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Jim Billington, the Librarian of Congress, and we hope that you've been enjoying this extraordinary National Book Festival. It's offered, it's involved. We have involved more authors than at any time in the 12-year history of this festival, and it's to them that we're especially thankful. And as you know, many generous sponsors make the free public event possible. And uh, one of them is Wells Fargo, which has the, been the sponsor of this particular pavilion, History and Biography. In a moment, I will introduce to you Michael L. Golden, Wells Fargo's regional president uh, for George Washington, great, I'm sorry, for G Greater Washington, D.C., who will introduce our closing authors today. We are privileged to have with them, of course, not only an extraordinary biographer, but also the two composers who are uh, inheritors of the legacy of the man who not only uh, led what has often been called the greatest generation to victory in World War II, but also uh, led the country to eight years of peace and prosperity, which are now becoming recognized in good part thanks to these authors that we have with us today to close things out, uh, being recognized by historians and by people for the remarkable contribution that he's made to our national life. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm happy to hand over for the last act in your main tent, Wells Fargo sponsored for us, um, Mr. Golden, uh, who will introduce everybody and uh, it's a tremendous uh, closing act, if you like, to a wonderful day, blessed with sunshine, with all your presence. And um, uh, I think they've got an extraordinary cast for this, which he will be pleased and others to introduce. And I'm sure we're all going to profit from this, this wonderful last act to a memorable day. Thank you, and all the best. And I think the discussion after. Mr. Golden. Mr. Golden. Thank you, Dr. Billingsley. And Wells Fargo is delighted to be the sponsor, both one of the key sponsors of both the Book Festival and this History Pavilion. Next, we have a very special program devoted to the life and legacy of our 34th president, Dwight David Eisenhower. I'm especially pleased to introduce this segment because I was actually born at the end of the Eisenhower presidency. Some of my grandfather's favorite memories, or my favorite memories, were spent with my grandfather, who was a huge President Eisenhower fan. Such a fan that when he visited my mother and I in the hospital for the first time, he told my mother, his daughter, I have the perfect name. Let's name him Dwight David Golden. <laughs> my mother preferred Michael, obviously, but throughout my childhood, my grandfather reminded me many times, you were really supposed to be named Dwight David Golden. How delighted would my grandfather be if he knew who I was about to introduce today. We are fortunate to have David Eisenhower and Julie Nixon Eisenhower joining us. David is an author, public policy fellow, and grandson of President Dwight Eisenhower. He is a public policy fellow at the Annenberg School of Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. In 1987, he was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Eisenhower at War, 1942 to 1945. David's new book, co-authored with his wife, Julie Eisenhower, is Going Home to Glory, a memoir of the life of Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1961 to 1969. Like her husband, Julie Eisenhower is also an author. She is, uh, in addition, the daughter, was the daughter of the 37th president, Richard M. Nixon. From 1973 to 1975, she was assistant managing editor of the Saturday Evening Post. During that time, she wrote Eye on Nixon. We also welcome Jean Edward Smith, the distinguished biographer for the 34th president, whose new book is critically acclaimed, Eisenhower and War and Peace. Mr. Smith has also written much praise biographies for Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Ulysses S. Grant. Mr. Smith is a senior scholar 
at Columbia University and after many years of spending time at the University of Toronto and Marshall University. Finally, our, our moderator for this program will be Jonathan Yardley, Pulitzer Prize winning critic for the Washington Post. Mr. Yardley has been a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and was awarded an honorary doctorate of letter by George Washington University in 1987. His most recent book is Second Reading, a compilation of some of the most memorable reviews of noted and neglected books from the past. Please join me in welcoming David and Julie Eisenhower, Jean Edward Smith, and Jonathan Yardley. We don't have much time, so I'm going to ask our panelists to get right to it. I'm going to ask first Mr. Smith and then the Eisenhowers to tell you just a little bit about the books that they're here to talk about. Thank you very much. Uh, Eisenhower in War and Peace deals with uh, President Eisenhower's two careers, first as a general and then as president. Uh, we're dealing with really one of the most underrated figures in American history both as a general and as president. One of the reasons for that is because Eisenhower made everything he did look easy. You may recall those bumper stickers in the election of 1956, Ben Hogan for president. If we're going to have a golfer, let's have a good one. <laughs> Eisenhower was Franklin Roosevelt's first choice to command the D-Day invasion. Eisenhower had three amphibious landings under his belt at that time. Uh, he got along well with the British and with Churchill. That was very important. And for President Roosevelt, there was no question that he was going to pick Eisenhower, although he gave General Marshall the opportunity to accept it, if, to, to command the invasion if he wanted. And Eisenhower, with characteristic self-discipline, refused to express an opinion, and President Roosevelt then selected Ike. Ike's generalship uh, is, is incomparable. No one else could have held the Western armies together as he did. His decision to land on D-Day, in spite of the weather, caught the Germans totally by surprise. They had no idea that an invasion was coming. Can you imagine 5,000 ships in the English Channel and the Germans not knowing it because of the weather? That happened. The decision to not to take Paris was Ike's decision, uh, to take Paris, rather, was Ike's decision as well. Allied plans set in the West were to bypass Paris and to continue the pursuit of the German army. But when General von Koltitz said that he would not destroy it if the Allies could get there, and they really only had two days to do that, otherwise Hitler would relieve him, Ike changed his plans and took Paris. Ike took field command really at, at the Battle of the Bulge after von Rundstedt broke through uh, in December of 1944. Eisenhower took personal command, gave the command south of the breakthrough to Patton and the command of all the troops north of the breakthrough to Montgomery, um, including the American Seventh Corps, and let simply Runstead run out of steam, run out of gas. And when he did, the German army was no longer capable of any type of offensive action. It was an incredible decision that Eisenhower made, and he made it on the spot. Eisenhower is also grossly underrated as president. Eisenhower made peace in Korea immediately upon assuming office. And before assuming office, he went to Korea, flew along the battle line on a Piper Cub, uh, looked at the battle line and decided this was unwinnable. Over the objections of the Taft wing of the party, of the generals on the spot in Korea, Mark Clark and Van Fleet and Sigmund Rhee, Eisenhower made peace. After Eisenhower made peace in Korea, not one American service person died in combat for the next eight years. Eisenhower believed that limited war was a contradiction in terms. That you don't go to war unless you mean to go to war, and then you do it all out. And as a, as a result, the United States remained at peace for the next eight years. Um, Eisenhower also was even-handed in his approach toward foreign policy and toward our allies. When Britain and France and Israel invaded and took the Suez Canal, our two oldest allies, our youngest allies, General Eisenhower insisted that they withdraw, 
and he not only insisted, but he organized through the Secretary of the Treasury a, on the Briti a run on the British pound, which really left the British no alternative but to withdraw. Domestically, Eisenhower was a progressive conservative. He believed ardently in a balanced budget. He was against deficit spending, but he also believed that government had a positive role to play. The interstate highway system, it was Eisenhower's brainchild. It, 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 more money was spent on the interstate highway system than FDR spent on the New Deal from 1933 to 1941, with zero impact on the budget because it was paid for through gasoline taxes. The St. The St. Lawrence Seaway, connecting the Great Lakes, uh, opening the Great Lakes to ocean traffic. Again, it's been on the board, been on the drawing board since the administration of Theodore Roosevelt, and Eisenhower pushed it through Congress. Eisenhower took, assumed the presidency at a time of McCarthyism and incredible communist witch hunting. Eisenhower broke McCarthy in the, it, 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 he broke McCarthy in the Army McCarthy hearings, but he did it as he did so many things in the background. It was Eisenhower who orchestrated the Army's response in the Army McCarthy hearings. Uh, I'm not going to get into a pissing contest with that skunk, he told his brother Milton. Uh, and when it was over, I, McCarthy had indeed been, been vanquished. But I think it was the desegregation issue, perhaps, in which Eisenhower is most often underestimated. President Truman had ordered the Army to be desegregated in 1950, but the Army had not complied, really. 85% of the Army was still segregated when Ike took power. Ike ordered the Army, Ike, the military services, to desegregate. And of course, he, this was a new Supreme Commander uh, who, whose, whose, word, whose word they immediately uh, obeyed. Uh, he eliminated the, the vestiges of segregation in the civil service. Uh, and when after Brown versus Board of Education uh, and the order, the integration of Central High School in Little Rock Eisen and the demonstrations there which blocked the desegregation, Eisenhower ordered the 101st Airborne Division from Fort Campbell to Little Rock to enforce desegregation. Uh, that was a forceful message to everyone in the South that the, the, the desegregation integration was the law of the land and that Eisenhower was going to support it with the armed forces of the United States it was a powerful message. Uh, <laughs> Finally, Eisenhower did not take the lead and argue the advantages of integration as John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson did. Eisenhower felt that this was a very difficult pill for the South to swallow, and the best way to get them to do that was to stress that this was the law. This was the rule of law, and he, as president, was going to take care that the laws be faithfully enforced. It made it much easier, an easier pill uh, for the South to swallow. Jonathan, it's great to be with you um, today and with all the book lovers at this fabulous festival and with the very distinguished biographer, Jean Edward Smith, who I think has contributed immeasurably to the Eisenhower Scholarship. And I have to agree, he was, under, he was underestimated, definitely. And I'm so glad that you've uh, written such a powerful book. I think it's fascinating um, in reading the book to see that more of the book it focuses on the military career, um, even though, as you just, you just spent almost most of your time talking about the incredible eight years of the Eisenhower administration. And as Dave leaned over and whispered to me, I've never heard the interstate highway system applauded before. It was great. It was pretty, pretty exciting. Um, first time. First time. I, I, have but, to, I have to interject that all those people who were applauding the interstate are now going to go out and get on 395 and be stuck in traffic for three hours. That's right. Um, our book um, is, is a different kind of book. We really, um, it, it's a memoir. It's David's memoir about life with his grandfather. It starts the day that his grandfather left office. And it really, the book you could look at in three ways. It's an intimate story of a grandson and a beloved grandfather. 
It's a story of the 60s and that whole turbulent time and the war in Vietnam and the protests. And it, it's also a study in power because on January 20th, 1961, Dwight Eisenhower was the most powerful man in the world. And as we do in our democracy, peacefully, he surrendered power to his successor, John F. Kennedy. He got in his 1957 Chrysler Imperial with Mamie, and they went on up to Gettysburg and you know, tooted the horn and said goodbye to the Secret Service. And one of the things that we do, that's really David's book, I've helped him write it, so I don't want to say we so much, but the assistant, one of the things David does with my help is to talk about how Eisenhower filled a very important role in the 60s, counseling his successors, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon. And when you think about the war, and I think Gene Smith made a very good point that Eisenhower didn't believe in incremental steps in a war. Um, he tried to counsel uh, Johnson. Certainly when my father came into office, because he died only three months after my dad was in the presidency, my father missed having that voice. But again, it's great to be with all the book lovers. I am also among your ranks, and now I turn it over to the author of the book. I am the, the helper and assistant, but he is the one who, it's really his story. So David. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, it is an honor indeed to be here at this uh, book festival, which is an extraordinary <clears throat> uh, event, and to be in the presence uh, of Mr. Smith, who has done something that I really admire, uh, and that is write a synthesis of uh, Dwight Eisenhower's life, and that is uh, <clears throat> uh, synthesizing uh, a military career and, and a political career uh, all in one, uh, very formidable subjects each. Uh, my uh, efforts in this field were, were enumerated at the beginning of the program, and I am proceeding at a very slower, much slower pace. Uh, actually, the book that uh, Julie is referring to, Going Home to Glory, is about Eisenhower's third career. Uh, he was an army general, and then he was a president, and then he became a farmer uh, in Gettysburg. And uh, my family, my father, my mother, my three sisters, and I, the eight of us, uh, lived in uh, Gettysburg, literally neighbors. Uh, and this is about uh, growing up with Dwight Eisenhower and experiencing him as a neighbor, uh, a grandfather on the scene, a boss, uh, a former uh, president of the United States. Julie made a very important point, and that is the uh, significance of this transition uh, that, the, where this book picks up. Dwight Eisenhower is the first president to serve under the operation of the 22nd Amendment. Uh, under the 22nd Amendment, uh, America, and this is different, uh, America requires men like Dwight Eisenhower, men with extraordinary vitality, we require them to give up power. These are people that would rule forever uh, in lots of societies. We not only require them to surrender power, we require them to be good sports about it. <laughs> and so on January 20th, 1961, even as he is uh, turning over the reins of power to a successor and he knows that his legacy is now in the loving hands of a Democrat, uh, uh, he is required to uh, be a good sport about this and to make this work. And I think that this is a, a very uh, important dimension of an ongoing story uh, that uh, is chronicled in Gene Edward Smith, Eisenhower in War and Peace. What America is doing in mid-century is America is rewriting the rule book. Uh, a long section of uh, Mr. Smith's book deals with the military-industrial complex uh, farewell that Eisenhower uh, issued as he was leaving office. That is a speech which, above all, addresses what I think is the great paradox of the 20th century, and that is how we could combine such growth and such progress, uh, the highway system being part of this, with the horrors uh, of the 20th century, the First World War, the Great Depression, World War II, the Cold War, the threat of nuclear annihilation. These uh, great horrors and great progress uh, sort of coexisted throughout the uh, 20th century. And the idea was, uh, in Eisenhower's mind, that this was a paradox. And American democracy, which was growing so quickly and on such an uh, uh, overwhelming scale, had to uh, understand or reorient itself uh, in these new circumstances. And so he ran, I believe, as a trustee. He was a Republican, particularly when I knew him, uh, in the 1960s, 
very much a Republican. In fact, uh, uh, I was uh, raised in sort of a non-political family. Uh, I was a perfect foil at Phillips Exeter Academy for the, one of the greatest uh, uh, practical jokes in PEA history, and that was my election nomination and election by acclamation and in absentia to the only partisan political office I've ever held, and that was Secretary Treasurer Young Democrats. At, at, at. <laughs> this became a news story, which is how my parents found out about it, and they thought it was kind of funny. My granddad didn't think it was funny at all. Uh, the man I'd known as granddad for years, I came to know as general, he was a partisan uh, in the 1960s, uh, but he was also a trustee. And he was somebody who came to power at the end of this enormous victory, which had uh, costs and com raised complex issues uh, for our society, like uh, every surviving society in World War II. And stepped forward as somebody determined to restore a two-party system, restore a constitutional balance uh, between the presidency and the Congress. And then, by his example, depart office. Uh, and to establish a 20th, uh, 20th century, 21st custom, 21st century custom, uh, as a reminder uh, that we are a nation uh, under laws, uh, and that uh, no one uh, in America is indispensable, uh, and that what is distinguishing about our country uh, is leadership at all levels and in all places. And I think that's what his uh, uh, life and legacy uh, really is. It is an honor to be here uh, in Washington at this uh, wonderful event. We're looking forward to responding to. Uh, anything uh, uh, members of the audience would have to say. Again, I admire Mr. Smith's ability to synthesize uh, this uh, uh, on this subject. We have dealt with uh, uh, the areas that we have covered in, in uh, uh, great depth, uh, and uh, these are various approaches, uh, but to a very uh, wonderful subject, and one that I'm glad to be see uh, glad to see is receiving such attention today. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. While I say a couple of things, I would like to urge those of you who would like to address questions to the panelists to come up and line up behind the two uh, microphones that are in these aisles. We'll be ready for you to start in just about a minute. I just wanted to make the observation that we are talking this afternoon about a president whose, rep whose reputation has um, fluctuated fairly substantially over the half century since he left the White House. And Mr. Smith, in particular, would be able to address this because the first book of his that I read, and in many ways the, the book of his that I still admire most passionately, is his biography of Ulysses Grant, who, of course, waited for more than a century to see his, his reputation pulled out of the ashes of a, a very mis, uh, great misunderstanding of his service in the White House. So anything that you all might like to say about where Ike's reputation is now and where you see it going, I think I, we would be interested. Oh, I think there's no question that Eisenhower's reputation is, is on the upswing, just as General Grant's is on the upswing. I, I, I am guilty of, of, of an omission. Eisenhower had three careers. He was also president of Columbia University. He was president of Columbia for five years, and he did a marvelous job at Columbia. He, he, the, the budget was in, uh, in a terrible shape. He, he balanced the budget. He organized Columbia's first fund drive. Uh, he defended academic freedom at Columbia at a time when that was not popular. He defended Columbia faculty who had been hauled before Congress. He provided really an umbrella behind which every other university president could hide. And he, he would have gone on to have been an outstanding university president, except that on, in November of 1948, Tom Dewey lost the election. And when Tom Dewey lost the election in 1948, Eisenhower was, had bigger fish to fry. Uh, because the Republican nomination in 1952 was going to be open at that point, and he, he, he lost interest a little bit in Colombia and went to NATO to head the NATO forces and so forth. But he did an outstanding job at Colombia, and he would have gone on to do an outstanding job, except he had a higher calling. Um, David, David, as I recall, you and Julie say rather early in your book that um, you saw Ike's reputation ebbing somewhat. Do you still feel that way? Uh, you mean returning? Well, I think for, uh, in fact, uh, the connection with Grant uh, to me is uh, uh, very interesting. I think that the, uh, we look back nostalgically on World War II as this great 
unqualified success. And so I think that one thing that we have not recognized, uh, though I believe that voters in the electorate in the 1950s did recognize uh, the fact, is that we were really uh, undergoing a post-war, a reconstruction period in the 1940s and 1950s. And so the uh, parallel between Eisenhower and Grant, uh, Lincoln and Roosevelt is a very compelling one. And um, <clears throat> I think the, um, uh, another reason that uh, people have not focused on this parallel is uh, because of uh, uh, Ulysses Grant's low reputation. Uh, and I can remember being set right by that, by, uh, on that subject by, uh, of all people, uh, Senator Charles Robb, who was a friend of uh, ours and came, came to visit us when Julie's dad was in the White House in 1969. And uh, uh, we were standing in a room where, where Ulysses Grant signed treaties, and, and I made some crack about his reputation. And as a Marine, uh, Chuck said, uh, uh, this is a career that has to be completely reexamined. Uh, and for the reasons uh, that I think that uh, you, uh, you have laid out, America underwent a post-war a post reconstruction. And I think it lasted uh, until a moment that uh, Julie and I were involved with uh, in 1972 and 73 firsthand. Uh, this is the end of the Vietnam War in China. This was a long post-war era in which America rebuilt Asia, rebuilt uh, Europe, uh, and rebuilt a better world. And Eisenhower is a global version of Grant, as FDR is a global version of uh, Abraham Lincoln in that scheme, as I see it. Thank you. We'll, we have about 10 minutes for questions, and you, sir, were first. Thank you. Uh, uh, President Eisenhower first ran 60 years ago. Where do you think he would be if he were running today on the issues of today? That's directed to Mr. Smith. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, that yeah. one is in the family. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'll say one thing. I think uh, without contradiction, I, I believe that... Uh, uh, Gene Edward Smith would agree about this, is the motif or the connection uh, between the contemporary Republican Party and the Republican Party of the late 1940s and early 50s uh, is the value it places on the private sector and free enterprise. Uh, one of the things, uh, and this is the episode of the Eisenhower administration that I remember best, and I have to say I think is the most important, uh, certainly part of his uh, second administration, and that was the desegregation of Central High School in Little Rock in 1957. I can remember uh, we were living uh, in Northern Virginia and we were driving past segregated schools every day uh, when we went to, uh, we, were, we were in school in the uh, Northern Virginia area. And uh, what the GOP has done since the late 50s is it has established itself in the South, uh, but it did so uh, and Julie's dad uh, uh, followed up on this as well, as well as Reagan uh, and other important Republican politicians. When the South became a two-party uh, region, it became that on the basis of economic and private enterprise questions. Uh, Texas became a Republican state because of uh, tremendous and very rapid uh, economic development in Texas, development of the energy sector and so forth. Florida, the same thing. Uh, Virginia, North Carolina, and other states. The idea was that the Republicans were not going to go south and outbid the Democrats on segregation, but they would try to transcend the issue by emphasizing economic development. This is the connection uh, between the Republican Party for as long as I can remember. Julie and I were actually guests in the White House about six years ago, and uh, we had an occasion uh, after dark uh, to walk uh, on the South Lawn and around the, uh, uh, the driveway where we had uh, walked so often before, and Julie excused herself and walked up the walkway to peer into the Oval Office. And she saw the bust uh, in President George W. Bush's office of Dwight Eisenhower. And he kept a bust there throughout his uh, eight-year presidency as a Texan and as somebody who recognized, as his father did, uh, and as Southerners did and as Republicans did, that the Eisenhower presidency in 52 begins a dialogue that we've had ever since. Uh, in which the positions will wax and wane, there will be stronger arguments, weaker arguments at any given time. But we, are, we have a robust private sector, we also have an effective public sector. Uh, and um, 
the Republicans uh, basically are advocates for the private sector, and that is the connection. Now, the rest of it, Julie, you want to uh, take it from? Yeah. Thanks. What's something we uh, would know about President Eisenhower, the farmer, after he retired from public service for arguably like his, most of his life? What would uh, we not uh, know about him? Uh, something that I think I capture in Going Home to Glory, uh, and that was the attention he paid to what he did uh, at the farm. I learned uh, an early lesson, I think, in leadership that I had articulated before he even went to college, and that is he was a leader, and I saw the way people responded to him and uh, understood that to be the case. I knew he was special, but above all, he was a leader uh, on the farm uh, because he took everything we did so seriously, and he was so well informed on, on everything we did. I think uh, the, the lesson I take away is uh, <clears throat> that uh, you do not ask others to do that which you are unwilling to do yourself. He's somebody who understood his operation. He's also the first person to hire me, so I was grateful to him as a boss. <laughs> he was the first to fire me, uh, so I was uh, <clears throat> sort of surprised by that. Uh, uh, I worked for six years on the farm, and I relate this in Going Home to Glory, uh, we played a game of honeymoon bridge over a lunch hour that went a little long. We thought the general was downtown. As it turned out, he was on the grounds, uh, broke up our game, and I experienced the Eisenhower temper. That was seeing the mouth move, and, and I wasn't sure exactly what he was saying, except that I did pick out, you are fired. <laughs> he was a very dynamic fellow. Two hours later, we had a golf date, the two of us. I, was, I wasn't sure whether he was going to show up. He did. He came to our home at at 4 o'clock, we went out to uh, Gettysburg Country Club. We played the first hole in silence, the second hole in silence. At the end of the third hole, and I'm sure Mr. Smith encountered this, he said, uh, uh, David, I allow my associates one mistake a year, and you've had yours. <laughs> and by the fourth hole, I had been rehired, uh, <clears throat> proving that to err is human and to forgive divine. And that is an element of leadership as well. But what I knew about him in Gettysburg is this is a leader. He's somebody who took things seriously. Uh, he knew when to be tough, and he knew when to be forgiving. So, mm. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question uh, for David Eisenhower. Uh, in 1968, this could also go to Julie. She might understand some of it. But in 1968, Richard Nixon, of course, looking for the nomination, uh, Republican nomination, to, be, to run for president. And I understand that Eisenhower was basically trying to be neutral in the entire thing, but at some point he felt compelled. And I... I'm always trying to figure out if there's any influence or what was the process. And I mean, I know he was facing, uh, of course, he's a coalition of, of Reagan and, and Rockefeller, and I guess even George Romney's in there somewhere. But I'm just curious what, what you guys have to say about that. Yeah, the sequence goes like this. Julie and I were uh, engaged in November of 1967. Uh, Richard Nixon announced for the White House January 31st, 1968, and Dwight Eisenhower endorsed him uh, in late July of 1968. Now, I'm describing the happiest day of my life. Uh, when uh, finally he uh, stepped uh, down from his position of neutrality to endorse uh, Richard Nixon. I think the idea there is that 1968 uh, was a year in which Republicans could win. And uh, I think that, uh, uh, therefore, Dwight Eisenhower extended an endorsement very carefully and made it very clear to me when uh, Julie and I were together that he would uh, uh, be doing, uh, observing his own uh, practice and so forth uh, uh, in the elections. He finally became persuaded uh, that uh, his vice president, uh, Richard Nixon, had the, the qualifications to uh, address the conundrum of 1968. There was a dominant issue in 1968, the Vietnam War, and we were losing. Uh, and Richard Nixon campaigned on a Delphic, uh, almost a uh, riddle, a Delphic pledge to end the war and win the peace. And Dwight Eisenhower came to understand what that meant uh, and uh, finally decided that because he had the qualifications to be president in 1968 that he would prevail uh, over his earlier defeats and finally uh, endorsed him uh, in July. We had, Julie had something to do with it because um, <clears throat> my grandfather was very entranced by Julie. Uh, and I promise you, I had nothing to do with it. I, I, I knew that if I uh, raised it or even asked it, uh, that uh, this was uh, taking liberties that, that I couldn't do. So I had nothing to do with it. But I was very happy when it happened. <clears throat>
We have time for only one more yeah. question, but those of you who are in line, will, I'll, you can ask questions shortly. Um, but here in this pavilion, you, you one more question. question Thank you. You mentioned being a good sport about turning over power. And I think it's very interesting that both your grandfather and your father were clearly partisans, but had to be a good sport. That capacity seems to be largely missing. Do you have perspectives on where we are, what's gone wrong, maybe even how we can fix it? Yeah, Gene, mm. absolutely. Eisenhower had a Republican Congress for the first two years. Uh, Joe Martin was Speaker of the House, and um, he had a very difficult time dealing with Republicans on Capitol Hill. The Democrats took over in the election of 1954, Sam Rayburn became speaker again. Lyndon Johnson was majority leader. Eisenhower got along marvelously with Rayburn and Johnson. Eisenhower happened to have been born in Rayburn's congressional district in Texas, which didn't hurt. Yeah. But uh, Eisenhower got along marvelously with, with Johnson and with Rayburn. They, they thought alike. Uh, they put the national interest first. Uh, they were aware of, of the party interest as well, but they had no difficulty working together. And almost all of the legislation of the Eisenhower period stems from a the time when there was a Democratic Congress. So it was a different time in that respect. And, and if I might differ slightly from the answer to the first question uh, as where Eisenhower would be today, back in 1952, running for the Republican nomination, it seems to me that Eisenhower defeated the Republican Party of today. On that note, thank <laughs> defeated the Republican Party of today. I, 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 would, I, I would like to thank I would like to thank our exceptionally dis distinguished panel. It's been an honor for all of us to have the three of them here. I urge you to read their books, which are every bit as good as, as you might think they are. And I hope you have a wonderful time this evening on I I395. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.